Welcome to the No Unfinished Business Podcast. There are a thousand different ways your clients can leave unfinished business, but no single advisor can address every issue. In every episode, we'll answer the important questions to help professional advisors focused on individual clients, attorneys, CPAs, and financial advisors, identify and eliminate those planning blind spots so you can speak competently and confidently to your clients and help them leave no unfinished business. Hey, Mark, thanks so much for joining today. Thank you for having me. Mark, today we're talking about an unforced error that a lot of businesses and probably more than would ever care to admit it find themselves in. Embezzlement from the inside. There's probably not embezzlement from the outside, but just thinking about the people you've brought in who are your employees who are taking home more than they should. This is something you've seen and help businesses recover from. What I wanted to talk to you about is, well, how do we recognize this? What do we need to do to stop this? Because this is an issue that's not going to go away. Technology is not going to solve it. There's just so much out there. What do we do? Okay. Well, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, and I, I'll take a, a different tack with you. I, I will uh, agree with you that there can be embezzlement from the outside. Um, your third party vendors, if they have access to your uh, banking, some can you know, steal via check or ACH or some other method. So um, don't think that it can just be embezzlement from the inside. Um, we've seen this year um, a dramatic increase in these kind of situations with clients that have been referred to us. Thankfully, no existing clients. We've had a couple in the past that have had embezzlement issues. And invariably, it's somebody who comes to us somewhat sheepishly and says, hey, somebody I... Uh, I trusted, controlled my finances, and and this literally happened with a, a home builder client of mine about three years ago, walked off with $300,000, basically oh funded her lifestyle. He kept, he came to me and he said, I kept thinking I was making money because I knew I was doing all this work, but I never saw it at the end of the day. And so that's a common refrain that people, particularly privately held companies, entrepreneurial owned companies, um, they're so busy doing the work that they don't necessarily have uh, the processes in place to manage uh, financially. And so what I want to talk about briefly today is what I call overall financial controls for a company. Uh, my background is I've been general counsel of a company that I owned and have served as outside general counsel for numerous companies over the last 26 years. And so part of what we do from a corporate outside general counsel perspective is to help companies put into place what I call PP and T processes, policies, and training or policy processes and training. So you have a policy put into place and then a process to implement the policy and then a training to, uh, to make sure that the policy and the, the process are implemented properly. And I want to talk briefly kind of as we, you and I talked about before during show prep, um, two main areas and then kind of an ancillary addendum at the end. Uh, the first one to talk about is, is more non-legal, but kind of what you were talking about, uh, the external, is what are, how, how do you recognize, uh, what are some warning signs of embezzlement in the first place? I mean, you said kind of, I think jokingly, well, you can't have embezzlement on the outside. Well, you can. I mean, you can have, let's say you use a third party, a bookkeeping service. A lot of people outsource the functionalities of their companies to third parties. So it's not always internally uh, that we think about uh, financial mismanagement, uh, embezzlement. And I'm using those terms in kind of a macro sense. I don't want to say, well, I'm, there may be a criminal lawyer who says embezzlement, you know, some right. criminal code issue. But from a macro standpoint, I'm talking about, you know, financial mismanagement, financial malfeasance, embezzlement as a shorthand. And it can be, you know, what if, if you have a bookkeeping service on the outside who is, they may pay your vendors, um, you know, they, they could be uh, stealing from you. So um, I want to go over and I'm happy, uh, John, if you want, I can, uh, I've got a white paper on this. I can send it. Yeah. Anybody wants it. We can talk we about that later, but go ahead. No, I was just going to say we can include links to make sure folks get that sure. if they want it. So I want to go over just a few highlights of maybe some warning signs for people so that you start to think about like this client of mine who had 
you know, I think kind of maybe a first um, warning sign is when people are like, you know, I work really hard. Um, there ought to be more money. And so that can be an actual warning sign that, you know, kind of in a, in a macro or strategic sense that I make a lot of money or a lot of money comes in. Why is my bottom line not what I think it is? Um, so that, you know, you could fall that call that under, you know, shrinking profits or disappearing cash that, hey, there's just not as much money coming in as I as I think. Um, another big one is vendors not receiving payments. Uh, we had a case recently where uh, someone had stolen a check, uh, a vendor from our client, a vendor contacted them and said, hey, you owe me this money. And they said, well, we, we mailed you the check. Somebody had intercepted the check somehow, either through the postal service or through uh, the, the vendor uh, had altered the check, cashed it and, you know, stolen some money. So um, if that starts to become a recurrent theme, that may mean that somebody internally is altering checks or is saying they're paying vendors, but they're pocketing the money, uh, things like that. Um, another big issue is um, or warning sign is the employee who wants to have a fiefdom over finances. And so that could be, um, they don't ever want to have uh, anyone else look over their work. They work all the time, they never take vacations. A lot of these things are kind of odd because they sound like they could be a really good employee. You know, it's like they, they work all the time. They don't take vacations. They're a slave to the company, but what it can, you don't, really as a as a company owner want those kind of employees i mean you want rested employees you want employees who take time off um, but it can be a warning sign of somebody who wants to, to absolutely control their fiefdom so that nobody can overlook their work and see that hey why didn't we pay the light bill or the this vendor or whatever uh, they often do that in terms of um, wanting to have absolute control you can start to see that in their attitude. They have a possessive attitude. Um, they don't give you, you know, documents when they're supposed to. Um, you you can start to see this, you know, just from a as a business owner, like, well, this just seems odd. Why is that? Right. Why is this happening? And so, um, you know, another thing is is to really look at um, your employees and and who they are. Um, kind of in the real world? Are they undergoing uh, financial distress? Um, are they living above their means? Um, do they have signs of addiction? You know, do they gamble? Do you know they're always uh, on the weekend at, uh, you know, Louisiana or somewhere at, at a casino? Uh, they have, you know, you as a business owner driving a used vehicle and they have a brand new car, you know what you pay them. Well, how would they do that? You know, all of these little things can add up to be a sign that somebody is living above their means. You know, I don't know. I'm financial fraud is kind of a academic interest of mine. I write on it. Um, I published on it. Um, and there's a show that I recommend to everybody. If you have any interest in this area called American greed, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's I have case, case studies. I think it's on MSNBC um, case studies of, uh, fraudsters, hoaxers, people like that. There's a very famous uh, case of the controller of a city in Illinois who um, is really the encapsulation of what I'm talking about. Um, the city never had the money they thought they should have from tax revenue. The streets were unpaid. They're having trouble hiring more police. Uh, they never, it was like, well, don't we have more money? Shouldn't we be able to do this? And the controller who controlled everything had no other controls on her lived this lavish nationally known lifestyle as a horse breeder she had this huge farm with all of these horses and she was known nationally and and if somehow anybody had been able to step in and say whoa what's going on how is this bureaucrat this city official able to afford this lifestyle or why don't we have the money we think we have so that it, it's really a fascinating, a sad, but fascinating um, encapsulation of what I'm talking about that I think the first thing anybody who's uh, interested in really having control of their business should do is really, you know, go down the list of warning signs. If they, if they have in the back of their mind, the idea that, 
hey, something's just not right in my business. I would get, you know, and you can Google warning signs or we're happy, like I said, to, to give you a link. Um, there's lots of government through various law enforcement agencies has publications on the issue. There are a lot of ways that a, a warning signs for a company to look at, but I would say those are the biggest ones is, you know, the person living above their means, uh, the employee living above their means, who may have addiction issues, they're having to fund, be it gambling, drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever the, the addiction is. Um, the, the employee who never takes time off, who is defensive about their work if it involves finances, and also that that um, things just start to pop up that aren't right, like the, the vendor is not being paid. Why is that? And so I would say those are kind of the uh, the non-legal, the, the real world instances of how do you really start to see uh, embezzlement? Yeah. And Mark, just kind of pulling even a step back, the, the warning signs are something we have to apply to possibly a bigger threat matrix than I was thinking of. It's not just your internal bookkeeper or the tax preparer. It's thinking about, well, who in your business has access to some level of control? Yeah. And I mean, even just hearing that that level of control could be monthly billing, is this, you know, is this something that should be looked at? I mean, I'll say that I got a note from my external bookkeeper, who's part of my CPA's team earlier this week, said, hey, we noticed that the phone service that you use, their bill was kind of wildly out of line for the last month. Is everything okay? And I'm glad they noticed it. But all we'd done was pay for the next year in advance to get yeah. it, you know, whatever, 10 or 20% discount on it right. so that we knew, you know, like, hey, that's great. We don't have to pay them now. We paid it all at once. Yeah. Well, I would say that, yeah, financial controls, financial fraud is not just um, classic embezzlement. Somebody's steal, writing a check to themselves. Although we've seen that this year, it blows me away that somebody in a company thinks they can just go on and on writing checks to their own personal biz, you know, needs. They bought cars, this one big case we have going in litigation right now. I am just like, you never thought it would be found out. They just wrote themselves checks. So uh, it was two partners and a business partner. Two of the partners came back and said, Hey, we've been doing all this business and um, now we want uh, to take, you know, reap the reward, let's make a distribution. And the guy who, the one partner who handled all of the money said, oh, we don't have any money. And they're like, what do you mean? Well, well he, you start pulling bank statements and the guy wrote cars for family. I mean, he spent several hundred thousand dollars just this year. So, but you're right. It's not just, you know, um, financial fraud. And I, I know it's outside of the scope of what we're talking about today, but I encourage business to really think about, like you said, the risk matrix of, financial fraud in a, in a very broad, you know, scam and hoax emails, you know, that's wire fraud is a big deal where with say a closing or somebody is buying or selling a house or something like that, where they say, Oh, Hey, so-and-so uh, we changed title companies uh, wire the money here instead, or they get your email and they, we get these a couple of times a month. Um, they'll email your employee and say, Hey, I'm at the, uh, ostensibly from me, because I'll have my name, but it won't be my email address. If you don't look closely, they'll say, hey, I'm at the courthouse. I need $200 in gift cards for some, it just doesn't sound right, but people, you know, will send money away in those in those ways. Wire fraud is an enormous, scary issue for businesses. So yeah. the, the external is, is as important as the internal. Right. And so kind of turning to that second thing you talked about is, well, we've got the warning signs, what are some of the bigger legal issues? I mean, I, the kind of obvious one for lawyers would be, well, we don't want money coming out of our IOLTA accounts to the wrong place, but our yeah. clients are gonna see more more than just liars, or liars, lawyers, well, let me edit that out. Okay. No worries. <laughs> um, but I mean, it, that's one specialized account. How do we make sure that we're yeah. tracking what we should be doing? And you know, what are those actual consequences? I, th I think the number one safeguard is multiple checks and balances. I, I'm just flabbergasted every time we get one of these cases where it's it's someone saying, well, it's somebody I trusted who had 
um, complete control of every step. So to me, the main issue is having multiple checks and balances on how money is handled. Um, that can be all the way from petty cash, like is up to, you know, like for us as lawyers, client funds through IOLTA, how that gets handled. Um, but the main thing is, you know, the, the money flowing in and out of accounts, typically via ACH or by check. So, you know, petty cash is uh, one thing. I mean, if you keep money on hand for, hey, we need to run to the store for cases of water or something, you want to have a log system, you know, logging in and out. We internally have uh, at our firm an internal incoming and outgoing mail log system so that every piece of mail gets logged. Um, I think that can be an internal financial control mechanism that's very useful because what can happen is people will intercept money going in and then divert money going out. So if you have to log, like say we've paid five vendors today and that's going out by check and it has to go on the outgoing mail log, then that's another mechanism whereby people can't just say, well, the mail, oh, well, we, I dropped it in the mail, you know, yep. um, the mail coming in is the same way. Um, so those, you know, find those physical paper or electronic controls are very important, but having somebody or having multiple people uh, oversee the money and reconcile it as I think the number one issue people need to, to do. Um, our firm, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so, I mean, paying with check is one thing. What, a, what do you think about kind of running most things through the firm credit cards? So you've got yeah. electronic records of it. Well, uh, credit cards are useful because, um, you know, there's uh, dispute mechanisms for that. If something gets used wrong, um, they're useful in that, in that sense. I mean, electronic payments are the, uh, we uh, wire as many funds as we can and and have dupl have mechanisms in place to confirm wiring instructions so that we're not physically sending checks i hate physically sending checks because um there's just the potential for abuse uh, not just abuse by somebody stealing but abuse by the people who are supposed to handle the mails i mean you get internal mail fraud that's why there's an inspector general of the postal service so anytime you've got a piece of paper that's a you know, a financial instrument that's floating around from hand to hand to hand, it increases the possibility and the risk that something negative can happen with it. So as much as you can, if you can have ACHs or electronic transfers or, or credit cards, um, those are, um, I think, better than checks, but they have their own possibilities for abuse. If you have, you know, obviously the credit card, the firm card or the company card that somebody can use, uh, they can be using it on things they're not supposed to, um, you know, gas, uh, food at the gas station, dry cleaning, whatever they do. And if you're not, um, if you don't have somebody looking over that, then um, it can slip by for a long time and you can bleed out money. So I think, you know, for what we do is we have an independent accounting firm that runs our uh, bill pay, um, our payroll, and our taxes and everything financial. We have an internal uh, office administrator who double checks the financials. And then my partner and I triple check credit card statements and the monthly financials. We have to sign the checks if a check goes out, um, those kind of things. So we have one outside group that's professionally licensed to do it. We have one employee internally that has to double check and then my partner and I each monthly statement so that we can start to pick up, hey, is something you know wrong here? We also, and it's not a perfect fallback, but you know our banker is good at, uh, you know, we send them our financial statements. I think it's quarterly. Uh, they look over things. So I would say the more independent eyes you have on things, the better. Um, you know, and that's where I get into PP and T. So the policy for us is you know, uh, only a partner can write a check or sign a check. The, the policy is uh, our outside accounting firm uh, has to be uh, prepare monthly financial statements. The policy is um, our internal 
uh, office manager has to review monthly um, statements on all accounts. Our policy is uh, we do annual audits. Our policy is uh, of our of our books. Our policy is you know we run our Ulta account according to the state bar's rules. Our policy is um, there's one more I was going to say, but anyway, it has to you know our policies are all in place to have multiple checks and balances and multiple financial controls in place so that hopefully nobody is stealing from us. Our process then is what I was talking, I kind of got backwards earlier, we have mail logs. So every piece of mail that comes in and out is logged. Our process is we get financial statements every month from our independent accounting firm. Um, our process is we reconcile monthly both with our office manager and the two partners all of the credit card statements. So those are the processes. And then lastly, um, training. We have internally to the firm a committee of uh, business continuity and fraud prevention, which is our external IT company. And then our office manager and one of the associates, mainly because I don't want to do it, um, that go over every quarter uh, financial uh, fraud issues, potential issues like hoax. We get a lot of hoax emails, mm. a lot of phishing expedition emails trying to scam us, um, like a lot of companies do. Um, insurance, business continuity, all of those kind of issues. We do have a formal committee that sits and meets and discusses that. And then they talk about training. Like we'll say, well, gosh, we've been getting a lot of these uh, emails that allegedly have mine or somebody else's uh, name on them. We'll do training on it. We'll send out a reminder from our IT company. Hey, this is popping up now. Remember, don't just send somebody money for you know. Uh, if there's a wire, if there's a closing with a real estate company, we have to confirm the wire. If somebody wants us to wire money out, we have to independently call them. We can't confirm solely by email. So that's the three we have in place, which is process, or I mean policy, this is what we're going to do, process, this is how we're going to do it, and then training, uh, this is um, how we should always be thinking about it. But I'd say the number one issue for um, business owners is do not have one person have control of every element of your um, financial system. I'll just run down a couple others. Um, monthly, and I know it's boring uh, for most people, review every statement that comes in, every credit card statement, bank statement, uh, any other kind of statement. Manage your cash flow and budget. You know, really have those, those numbers kind of at hand so that you can see, hey, am I not making the money I think I should be? Is there money drifting away somewhere? Am I, is, am I bleeding cash in some way? I'm not meeting expectations. Um, I would run background checks on every employee you have. If you pop up and somebody went to jail for fraud or financial theft or some other reason, you probably shouldn't hire them. Right. Uh, for businesses that are uh, inventory heavy in nature, uh, let's say you're a wholesale or something, inventory control systems are, are very important. Inventory can walk out the back door and get sold, you know, tires, uh, metals, lumber, Anything in a heavy inflationary environment uh, that you have an in inventory probably can be sold uh, by someone. Um, again, review all of your outgoing payments every month. Um, sign all your own checks. Don't let anybody else have a signature stamp or sign your checks. And then lastly, financial reviews and audits. So it's a, it's a systematic process oriented um, system that needs to be in place. Um, and then I would say, lastly, I said, in terms of an addendum, I would um, talk to your insurance folks about it, employee theft insurance, uh, errors and emissions, all the different types of policies that can be in place for uh, to cover financial fraud uh, or other kinds of fraud that you may encounter as a business owner. Excellent. Mark, you've gone over a lot. Uh, you kind of hit on the, well, where do you even start? question I was going to ask you. So I think we'll just close with this. People are looking to get more from you, whether it's they've had an issue and they need to get it resolved, or they want to bring you in to have them have you kick their tires. Where can 
uh, our listeners reach you? So uh, first, best place is our website, uh, www.mktxlaw.com. Uh, I'll give you my cell phone number if anybody wants to text or call me. It's 832-405-4440, uh, One thing we do is a free corporate diagnostic for companies. Uh, we do not charge for it. Uh, it's 11 categories, 27 pages, uh, everything from corporate structure to insurance to litigation to strategic vision. Then we do a report back with our findings, any red flag items um, and action items off of that. And it gives you as a business owner a blueprint for where you stand as a company. Certainly financial controls falls within that. So we're happy to consult at no cost to anyone who feels like, eh, I may have a question or I'm a little losing a little sleep over this. Excellent. Mark, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening. You can find more episodes, videos, and links to more helpful content at nounfinishedbusiness.com. If you have any questions, feedback, or ideas for topics, please reach out via social media or email john at john at strohmeyerlaw.com. And of course, if you or your clients need help from John with an estate planning, probate, trust, or cross-border tax issue, you can book time directly with John at askjohnaquestion.com. 